So now we're gonna actually measure range of motion of the ankle, which is honestly the one measurement that we would use more often when compared to the toes. Toes, very rare clinical measurement, but certainly ankle uh, measurements are important, specifically after an ankle sprain. So we're going to talk about four different measurements for range of motion. The first and probably most common is going to be dorsiflexion range of motion. So dorsiflexion is when those feet or toes are going towards the shin, okay? So in terms of our goniometer anatomy, what we wanna make sure of is that the fulcrum or fixed arm, right, is um, going to be on the lateral side of the limb. We wanna make sure that this metal piece right here is going to be on the lateral malleolus and your movement arm is going to be moving with the fifth metatarsal. So let me just show you positioning first. Okay, so metal piece right on the center portion of your fibula. You guys might say, well, how do I know that this is uh, where it needs to be? So the first thing I'm gonna do is have to find that fibular head. And then what I typically do, I'll extend my finger out to make sure that it's in alignment. Okay, guys? So now that I know that this is aligned, now that I have my metal piece where I need it to be, what I typically do clinically is just place the goniometer at zero degrees or for some of you, what we consider to be 90 degrees, okay? And then what I'll have my patient do is go ahead and dorsiflex. Keep going, Suze. And I'll look and I'll, I'll make sure that this line is very parallel to that fifth metatarsal. Keep pushing, Suze, if you can. Great. So in this instance, what we would say is Suze has about five degrees of dorsiflexion range of motion. Now, you all might be saying, well, what's normative? Uh, normative is 15 to 20 degrees of dorsiflexion range of motion, which means what about our patient? That she is lacking dorsiflexion range of motion, which is a terrible thing to lack, because what that means is, is that she's lacking dorsiflexion, the foot's in more plantar flexion, which then means she's more susceptible to ankle sprain moments. So I would ask my patient a historical question. Have you sprained your ankle before? Yes. Have you sprained your ankle multiple times? One of the reasons that our patient might be saying yes is because that she's not getting enough dorsiflexion range of motion, okay? Now we're gonna move into plantar flexion and believe it or not, the setup is the same as it would be for dorsiflexion. So stationary arm here, metal piece right at the distal portion or tip of the fibula. I'm just gonna measure to make sure that this is bisecting that fibular head. And then what I'm gonna have my patient do is I'm gonna stabilize here. I'm gonna have my patient point their toes down as far as they can go. And then I'm gonna take that goniometer and I'm gonna do the same thing. Now you're gonna be tempted to take it all the way down here. But remember, we want this black line to be very parallel to that fifth metatarsal. So what we're going to do here is we're gonna start again and we're gonna start at 90. Suze, go ahead and flex for me. What I'm going to do is look at how much range of motion Suze has. So Suze has approximately 48 degrees of dorsiflexion range of motion. So for plantar flexion, she's not lacking because the normal range of motion for plantar flexion is 40 to 50 degrees of plantar flexion range of motion. But with that being said, there is a subset of population who will have upwards of 70 to 80 degrees of plantar flexion. Those people are known as dancers, acrobatists, uh, and gymnasts, right? Because they're gonna spend a lot of time in that point position or plantar flex position. So don't be alarmed if you get a patient who has 70 to 80 degrees of plantar flexion, that would be their, what we call, new normal, okay? So we've done dorsiflexion range of motion, we've completed plantar flexion range of motion, now what we're going to do is assess inversion and E version range of motion. And what you might notice as you're doing this is number one, when we move into inversion, we get a lot more inversion than we do E version, right? And if you guys are stewards of the anatomy, what you would know is that this fibula, right, on the lateral side comes down more inferiorly than its medial counterpart, the tibia. So for that reason, we can't really move into eversion as much because that fibula is blocking us from moving, right? Whereas on this inversion moment, the tibia isn't as long, so we can get more motion of the foot. So you should expect that when you're measuring your range of motion. So with that said, with inversion range of motion, what we want to do, 
is place the stationary arm of the goniometer along the tibial crest of the, of, of the tibia. Want to place that metal portion of the goniometer in the center of the Taylor dome. So you'll have to know your anatomical structures. So we're going to place that in the center of the Taylor dome to make sure this is aligned to the tibial crest. And this movement piece is going to bisect the second phalange. Okay, and it's going to move with the second phalange. It's important to keep this in mind. So if I say to my patient, please take your toe and point it inward, I'm going to move in this direction here, and I'm going to see that Suze has 35 degrees of inversion range of motion, right? You might be saying, well, what's normal? About 15 to 20, right? So this is a patient who either spends a lot of time in an inversion moment, right, and has stretched those ligaments because she has 15 more degrees of inversion range of motion than the normal person would. Okay, and then what we're gonna have our patient do is go back to just a neutral position, and then we're gonna have her push her pinky toe out as far as she can. So I'm not kidding you guys when I say that she has exactly zero degrees of eversion uh, range of motion, but let me take off the goniometer so you can actually see that visually with your own eyes. I'm not making this up, right? The ideal would be if we're measuring eversion range of motion that your patient would have about five to 10 degrees. And so what that tells me is she's not maximizing the appropriate amount of motion in the foot, but it also tells me that she's spending more time in which direction, guys? If she can't get an eversion, then she has to be spending more time in inversion, right? Which obviously tells us something. She had increased plantar flexion. She has increased inversion, not enough eversion. Does it make sense why she continues to sprain her ankle over and over again? These are the things in your clinical practice that you have to pay attention to if you really truly want to figure out what is going on with your patient. Okay, so we're moving into ligamentous testing of, of the foot and the ankle. And we're gonna start with the most injured ligament in the foot and the ankle, which is the anterior talofibular ligament. Uh, so with that said, in order to test the anterior talofibular ligament, you have to perform what is called the anterior jaw test. The anterior jaw test can be performed in a few different positions. I'm going to show you each of those positions and then make the argument for one of them being the better clinical way to assess uh, the anterior talofibular ligament. So in, with your patient seated, with their knee extended, uh, with their foot hanging off the edge of the table and in a neutral position, you are going to do the following. You are going to cup the calcaneus just like this. You're going to stabilize distal tibia. I wanna be clear here that we should not be stabilizing right over the ankle joint because that's where they're probably going to be painful, right? So you're gonna get a fa false positive. Wanna make sure we're above the ankle joint to avoid causing pain. The next thing that we wanna do is make sure that our, our hand that's on the calcaneus is in a really good position to support the patient's foot, right? The last thing we wanna do is drop an ankle sprain patient because they won't trust us. So what I typically do is cup the calcaneus and make sure that that foot is resting on my forearm, right? And many of you might say, what if they have sweaty feet? You can wash your forearms after you're done, right? So stabilize here. And then what we're going to do is what's called an anterior jaw test. The purpose, the function of the anterior jaw test is to glide that calcaneus anteriorly. So ultimately what I want is my patient's second ray to kind of touch my nose. That's the direction in which I want to do this jaw. My teacher taught me that when you do this test, you want it to behave like you're pulling your drawer out of your dresser. There isn't any upward or downward movement. It's just a fluid movement out of, out of the socket. So same thing here. Stabilize here. Make sure you're cupping the calcaneus. And, and you know, I think of digits two and, um, or three and four on the Achilles, and I'm ready to go, right? 
So the direction of pull is going to be one from a posterior to an anterior position. And it is a slow, subtle pull. Do you guys see that? So we're here, here, and I could keep going, right? You wanna go until you either get an infill, right? That means a block, something stopping you. Most often that's going to be that ligament or they have pain, right? So it's here, anterior door. This would be a positive. Can you see how I'm getting gapping right here? Focus right here, ready? You'll see the gapping from her ankle. That would be a positive, she's loose there. So what is a positive anterior door? This is a ligamentous stress test. So what that means is, is do we care if the patient has pain? Most certainly. But a positive test is one in which there is a laxity or looseness about the joint, okay? A negative test would be if there was no looseness, if you tried to move it and it wouldn't move, okay? So that's an anterior drawer test. Again, used to assess the integrity of the anterior talofibular ligament. Our next special test is the inversion Taylor tilt test. It is a test used to test the uh, ligamentous integrity of the calcaneal fibular ligament or the CFL. So it's that ligament right here, the ligament that's going to hold the fibula to the calcaneus, okay? It prevents inversion, if you remember that from the anatomy section. So same hand placement as the anterior door test here and here, relax for me patient. Foot in a neutral position, not dorsiflexed, not super plantar flex, but just in a neutral position. And this time, instead of pulling anterior, what I'm going to do is, same hand positioning, rock the calcaneus inward into inversion. Okay, let's see that again. I'm going to rock that calcaneus inward. Now, I have seen students do this test wrong every year. It's the first time I'm recording this, so I wanna make sure that you have it perfect when you come into the class. You are cupping the calcaneus. This part of the foot is not moving. It is not the forefoot. It is the calcaneus that we are moving. So look at this, it's here. Do you see that one hand? It's the calcaneus. It is not a forefoot test. We'll get there later. It is a calcaneus test. It is important. It is important, I'm repeating, that you tilt the calcaneus. Why? Because the distal attachment of the calcaneal fibular ligament is the, you got it, it's the calcaneus. So if we don't move the calcaneus, we will not test the ligament, okay? So a positive test would be increased range of motion into inversion compared to the uninjured side, okay? All right, our next test is the uh, posterior drawer test. Don't bother searching for it in your textbook. It's not there, but it only makes sense, right? If there's an anterior drawer, there has to be a posterior drawer. So the posterior drawer is going to assess for the posterior Taylor fibular ligament. And so just like with the anterior drawer, we pulled it anterior. The posterior drawer, we're gonna be pushing the calcaneus and the talus posteriorly. Stabilize here. This time, instead of having my hand here, I'm gonna have my hand anterior. Now you'll notice that I'm using my thigh, right, to support the patient's foot. I'm going to put my, this portion of my hand web into the Taylor dome, and I'm going to do a posterior glide. So I'm now gliding that foot in this direction, right? Increase glide into the posterior direction would mean injury or compromise to the posterior talofibular ligament. I'll say this for you guys. It is only injured in about 5% of ankle sprain cases. So the odds of you getting a, a positive uh, posterior drawer test in your lifetime is, is very slim, but at least still do it as a part of your actual uh, ankle evaluation. Okay, so we've tested all three ligaments, the anterior talofibular ligament, the CFL or calcaneal fibular ligament, and the posterior talofibular ligament. Our next assessment is going to be of the deltoid ligament itself. So we did, we did special testing on the lateral side of the foot. 
Uh, and so now it becomes important to assess the deltoid ligament, which is on the medial side of the foot, right? Remember, it's the only ligament. But the great thing about the deltoid ligament is it is not injured often. And remember, it goes back to range of motion. We have more inversion range of motion than we do eversion. Therefore, the deltoid ligament isn't injured very often, but when it is injured, it takes a lot longer to heal when you compare it to the lateral ankle ligaments. So there are a few special tests that we will use to assess the deltoid ligament. The first one is the sister to the inversion Taylor tilt test. It is called the eversion Taylor tilt test. So your hand positioning is going to be the same. I'm going to be here with stabilizing hand. I'm going to cup that calcaneus and I'm going to literally try to evert that calcaneus. Now, the no fun part is there's no movement in eversion. You guys can see it, right? I'm trying to evert that calcaneus, but it's not going anywhere. So most often this eversion Taylor tilt test will be positive if you know movement, more movement into calcaneal eversion when compared to the other side. So you're looking for e more movement into eversion during this test. Could the patient have pain? Most certainly, but that is not considered to be a positive eversion Taylor tilt test. They have to have laxity present. So some interesting things about the deltoid ligament. Remember I said it's like it's broken up into four bundles. There's this middle bundle, which the eversion Taylor tilt test will, will test. But then we have an anterior bundle and a posterior bundle that also has to get tested. Those don't get tested in the eversion stress test. So we then move to what is called the Kleiger's test. Now, most tests that we've done so far have been driven through the hind foot. The Kleiger's test is a four foot test. So with Kleiger's test, we're going to cup here and stabilize, but the difference is in my hand position, right guys? So with Kleiger's, I'm going to cup all five metatarsals. I'm gonna cup the plantar aspect of the foot. I'm gonna stabilize here. And then what I'm going to do is literally try to evert the forefoot, which is so different, right? Here's eversion stress test. Now here's Kleiger's. Why do we need to do Kleiger's in this position? Because Kleiger's, if you can't tell, is going to be stressing that more anterior portion, right, of the deltoid. Eversion stress test is going to be testing that more centralized version of, of the deltoid, okay? Kleiger's can also be done in a dorsiflex position. So we've got a neutral position for Kleiger's, and now we have a dorsiflex position for Kleiger's, okay? Okay, so we have been talking about lower ankle ankle sprains, but the reality is we have patients who walk into our clinic who also have what are called syndesmotic or high ankle sprains, right guys? Uh, and the special testing for that pathology is so different. So there are really three special tests that we can use to kind of rule in or rule out a syndesmotic ankle sprain. The first one is Cotton's. This is, one, this is one of the tests that I didn't learn until I actually left and went to graduate school. So with Cotton's, your patient is going to be in a sideline position uh, and you want the lateral side to be pointing down towards the ground with the medial side facing up, okay? You're going to stabilize like you've always been doing at mid tibia. And then what you're going to do with the test hand is you're going to grip the calcaneus in this direction. Now, I wish I could show you my finger position, but you want your finger position to, to touch, you want it to touch the fibula, okay? Because the goal of this test is to see if there's fibular movement or displacement when you slide this calcaneus, okay? So envision that with me as we do this. So my hand is going to be over the calcaneus, as you guys can see that there. Digits three and four are going to be touching the tip of the fibula, okay? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to glide the calcaneus laterally. Makes sense, so I'm gliding that calcaneus down towards the ground. Ready? So I'm here, and then I'm literally trying to glide that calcaneus. 
all while feeling that fibula, right? What we know about high ankle sprains is if there is a high ankle sprain, you will have increased movement from medial to lateral. And what you will also feel as that calcaneus glides laterally is the fibula move a little bit, right? Because that ligament has been, has been stretched. So a positive Cotton's test is one in which there's increased translation in the lateral direction. So another test that we can do for a syndesmotic ankle sprain is the squeeze test. Uh, it can also be used for a fracture, but we'll talk about that a little bit later in the segment. For a syndesmotic ankle sprain, what we want to do is essentially squeeze the tibia and fibula together. So what I'm going to do is stand on the side of my patient. I'm going to take my hands in this position here. Okay. What I want to do is make sure that I'm gripping tibia here and that I'm gripping or have a good grip on the fibula laterally. What I'm going to do is squeeze those two bones together. Hopefully you can see that. The goal is when squeezing that essentially we would cause a forking or a spreading of the distal tibia fibula and that that would cause pain. So a positive squeeze test for a syndesmotic ankle sprain would be increased movement of the fibula and pain in the syndesmotic area. Last but not least for the syndesmotic ankle sprain is what we call the dorsiflexion eversion test. As the name implies, that's exactly what we're going to do. Essentially what we're going to do is force that ankle up into dorsiflexion maximally and then evert the foot maximally at the same time, right? So I'll do it again. Go up into dorsiflexion first and then an eversion moment. This would be positive if you have increased splaying of the fibula on the lateral side or pain in the area of the syndesmosis. So pain in the area of the syndesmosis joint. For fractures of the tibia and fibula, there really are two uh, special tests that you can use. Uh, the first is uh, the squeeze test, which we talked about for syndesmotic ankle sprains, but the squeeze test, a little bit different for fractures. What you wanna do is find the fracture, and again, you wanna place one hand proximal to the fracture, and then one hand distal to the fracture, and you wanna squeeze, okay? And the question is, do they have pain with that, okay? The other thing that you want to do is you can bump or what is called tap, right? Similar to the toe tap test, but on the calcaneus. And no, I'm not just slapping it, right? Extend the wrist and really tap that calcaneus, right? Because what you want to do with that is send vibratory forces up the tibia or the fibula. Positive for this would be pain on either the tibia and or the, the fibula, okay? The, the probably best special test to use for, um, for ruling out a fracture of the tibia or fibula is actually the hop test. So you're gonna have your patient get off of the table. Patient's gonna stand right here. And what you're gonna have that patient do is hop five times in a row, okay? So Suze, what I want you to do is hop five times. A Little bit higher. Good. If your patient can do that, that means they don't have a fracture. But most often what we see with tibial or fibula stress fractures is when they attempt to hop, when they go, when they come down, they essentially will collapse in pain, right? If they can get to five hops, that's a negative. Typically a patient with a fracture of the tibia or fibula won't get to two hops before they actually collapse. So a positive hop test would be collapsing before they hit five hops. With this test, it's very important to make sure that your patient is hopping high enough so that when they come down, they're actually loading the tibia. So you wanna at least make sure they're about an inch or two off of the ground.
So there are three uh, pathologies that we really couldn't group into special tests. Uh, so we're gonna talk about those now. The first one is an os trigonum injury, most often seen in athletes who participate in a lot of plantar flexion moments. So again, the dancers, the gymnasts, uh, we see it a lot in soccer athletes as they're participating after a goal and they slide and then they land and their feet are plantar flex and they're on their knees and they're celebrating. Um, so what is an os trigonum injury? If we think about os trigonums, essentially what we're saying is that the talus has a posterior bone called the stedia process. And as little itty bitty infants, uh, that stedia process essentially ends up fusing to the posterior aspect of the talus. And in most human beings, there is no problem. But in some uh, patient populations, if they are forced into plantar flexion, they can actually fracture off that stedia process uh, and have experienced a lot of pain. The scary thing about an os trigonum injury is that the only way that it's typic typically painful is during extremes amount of plantar flexion. So the test for an os trigonum injury is passive over plantar flexion. So I'm gonna stabilize here and I'm literally going to plantar flex that patient's foot. So literally take her into maximum plantar flexion. A positive, test would be one in which the patient reports extremes amounts of pain during the end range of, of plantar flexion. Our next special test is for an Achilles tendon rupture. For patient positioning, that patient is going to be in the prone position or on their stomach, okay? They're gonna have their leg um, about midway hanging off the edge of the table, so about mid tibia, foot's going to be dangling off of the edge of the, the, the table. With a Thompson's test, you want to be on the side of your patient and you are going to essentially place your hands in the same possession, position as you did for a squeeze test. So what we're gonna do is place our hands over the bellies of the gastrocnemii and what we're going to do is squeeze. And the focus is going to be as I squeeze, can you all see the foot moving into plantar flexion, right? So in a normal patient, when I squeeze, that foot is going to move into plantar flexion, right? But in a patient who has an Achilles tendon rupture, because there has been a disconnect between the distal portion and the proximal portion, when I go to compress, there will be no plantar flexion occurring at the foot. So a positive would be an absence of plantar flexion when you squeeze. And finally, uh, the, the special test that I save for last because it's the most catastrophic is Holman's test. Holman's test is a test of a blood clot, um, in particular an embolus after uh, a knee surgery. So most often what we see is that after knee surgeries, patients are at the highest risk for blood clots. These blood clots can kill patients. So it becomes very important that we're able to identify these patients post-surgery and then to know what special tests um, can be used to rule in or rule out the thrombus embolus pathology because it is life-threatening. Uh, I think I've told many of you the story, but uh, we, when we were in Virginia, uh, my husband's cousin actually fractured his patella, went in for surgery, was an easy surgery, in and out. Uh, went home, uh, the next day his wife found him passed out unconscious in the bathroom uh, and believe it or not, it was because he threw a clot uh, during surgery in his calf. Uh, and so uh, sadly enough, he ended up passing away from something so very simple that we didn't recognize. So this is an important pathology to identify in the first three days post-surgery. You wanna test them at nauseum um, to make sure that they don't have a clot that we can't recognize. So Holman's test, the way this works is post-surgery, if a patient comes into you and they are complaining of extreme amount of calf pain, we have to rule this out. Again, it is life-threatening, okay? My husband's cousin was only 41 when he passed away, right? So it can happen to anyone. So you want your patient's knee to be extended. Most often I'll have my patient lay back just so that they're relaxed. You want the patient's knee to be extended. As the clinician, what you're going to do is lift up their injured leg. You're going to dorsiflex the foot. Most often I'll use my body to do that. So I'll dorsiflex the foot. And then here's the key to this test. In between the gastroc heads, you are literally gonna kind of poke in there, right? And if they say, oh my gosh, I have a lot of pain, it's an automatic referral to the emergency room. 
Did you hear me? It's an automatic referral. And if they say, oh, there's nothing wrong, it's just a strain, then you feel better than having a patient go home and, and pass away from something that you could have recognized. So again, are you ready? Typically, I'll lift the patient's leg up, I'll dorsiflex the foot, and then I'll go in here with digits two through five, right in the middle of those gastroc heads, and I'll apply a little tiny bit of pressure there just to see if there's pain. If there's pain, you either take them, you have someone take them, to make sure that they don't have a blood clot. So that's going to conclude the special testing and range of motions and palpations for, for the foot and the ankle.